Shelley. Shelley Ruler, Director of Department of Managed Health Care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Hernandez, committee members. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, my remarks will provide a brief overview of the Department of Managed Health Care, our role regarding health plan mergers and acquisitions, our role regarding nonprofit health plan restructuring, how we monitor the negotiated undertakings in these transactions, and the status of the health plan mergers the department is currently reviewing. Um, so just as a background, I know a lot of you are familiar with our department, but the Department of Managed Healthcare licenses and regulates 122 healthcare service plans that provide healthcare services to more than 25 million Californians. We regulate the vast majority of commercial plans and products in the large group, small group, and individual markets, including all of the plans that participate in Covered California. We regulate 17 of the 22 managed healthcare plans that provide Medi-Cal services to California's Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So the department, first and foremost, is a consumer protection agency. Uh, our mission is to protect consumers' health care rights and ensure a stable health care delivery system. To accomplish our mission, the department derives its authority from the Knox Keene Health Care Service Plan Act of 1975. The department requires full-service health plans to have contracts with hospitals, physicians, and ancillary health care providers for the full range of covered health care services. Health plans must provide timely access to health care services to their enrollees. They must meet strict financial solvency requirements to ensure they can pay providers for the services delivered to plan enrollees. Health plans must also have systems in place that allow consumers to file grievances and appeal denials of care. The department's help center is available to assist consumers when they have problems accessing care, whether it's uh, they've been denied care or have an urgent need for care, they have a question or complaint about their coverage or simply don't understand how their coverage works, the Help Center can answer their questions and help them resolve their problems. So our role, ultimately, is to ensure that plans fulfill their obligations to their plan enrollees. So plans that wish to consolidate must first obtain approval from the department. And Senator Wynn had asked, like, who, which department approves, and we approve um, health plan mergers or disapprove them um, for uh, plans that are under our jurisdiction, and I think the Department of Insurance does the same for them. Our primary focus when reviewing mergers is to ensure health plans comply with the strong consumer protections and financial solvency requirements of the Knox Keene Act. Our review of mergers between health plans focuses on many different factors, including organizational and administrative changes, such as changes to grievance and appeals processes, utilization management, and clinical decision making. Health delivery system changes, such as changes to provider networks. Uh, any product or subscriber contract changes that could impact enrollees, including uh, subscriber documents, such as evidence of coverage documents or notices. Uh, the organization structure of the plans pre and post merger to understand who will hold control. And financial changes, including their, uh, the impact of the merger on tangible net equity, working capital, operations and claims payment, as well as the financing of the transaction and the impact to the health plan's financial stability. In addition to all of the issues the department must consider in its review of any health plan merger, if the merger involves a nonprofit health plan that's converting or restructuring to a for-profit health plan, the department must review the transaction under the requirements set forth in Article 11 of the Knox Keene Act. And Article 11 applies when two factors are present. First, the plan must be a nonprofit corporation that has assets subject to a charitable trust obligation. And, and two, if the nonprofit plan has such assets, the plan must be restructuring or selling a substantial portion of its assets to a for-profit entity. So none of the four mergers that the department has to review have involved converting a nonprofit health care service plan to a for-profit entity, so Article 11 does not apply. In the case of Blue Shield, a nonprofit health plan that purchased Care First, which was a for profit health plan, Blue Shield converted Care First to nonprofit status after the merger was approved. And during our review, the department looked at Blue Shield's articles of incorporation, its bylaws and history, as well as the law regarding nonprofit mutual benefit corporations, and determined that Blue Shield does not have assets subject to a charitable trust. Therefore, even though Blue Shield was a nonprofit, uh, Article 11 did not apply. The department can require health plans to commit to making certain improvements in their healthcare delivery system as part of our approval process. These commitments, which we call undertakings, are also used to ensure that mergers benefit California consumers. Undertakings are enforceable commitments agreed to by the plans. Some undertakings require the plan to submit post-merger information to us. 
and we use a tracking system to monitor plans to ensure they keep the commitments that they've made during the merger review process. The department staff review each plan filing very carefully to ensure the plan's meeting its commitments. We may also conduct on-site audits to determine whether the plan is complying with undertakings. We also follow up on those undertakings during regularly scheduled financial exams and medical surveys. For example, in the case of the 2005 Pacific Care United Healthcare merger, the department reviewed plan compliance with financial undertakings during two subsequent financial examinations. As I'm sure you all know, we currently have three mergers that we are uh, currently reviewing. Centene's acquisition of HealthNet, which is a $6.8 billion transaction. HealthNet has approximately 3.1 million enrollees in the commercial Medi-Cal markets, as well as uh, enrollees in a specialized behavioral health plan. Centene has about 169,000 Medi-Cal members. We held a public meeting about this merger on December 7th, 2015. Uh, the second one is Aetna's acquisition of Humana, which is a $37 billion transaction. In California, Aetna has about 1.4 million enrollees in, commercial, uh, in a commercial product. Uh, they have a specialized dental plan as well as a specialized mental health and employee assistance plan. Humana enrollment in California is about 65,000 Medicare Advantage enrollees. Uh, the public meeting uh, on that transaction was held on January 4th of this year. And then finally, Anthem's acquisition of Cigna is valued at $54.2 billion. Um, Anthem's, Anthem Blue Cross's commercial and Medi-Cal enrollment of about 3.6 million members in California, have, they also have a small number of specialized dental plan enrollees. And Cigna um, includes, in, at least under our jurisdiction, 182,000 commercial enrollees and about a half a million members in three specialized health plans. We had a public meeting on that transition, trans acquisition um, on March 4th. So the department has held public meetings on each of these transactions to solicit comments from interested parties for our consideration as we review them. During the public meetings, representatives from consumer groups and provider organizations urged the department to consider these health plans performance regarding access to care as part of our approval process. Consumer group representatives have urged the department to ensure plans improve their quality of care and patient satisfaction scores, as well as their performance in the areas of accurate provider directories, timely resolution of grievances, requests for independent medical review, and meeting enrollees language access needs as conditions of the department's approval. Noting their concern about the potential effects of these mergers on premium rates, consumer group representatives also have recommended that we obtain greater detail on any premium rate increases proposed by the plans and ensure that the costs of the merger are not included in any future premium rate increases. Provider group representatives have raised concerns that mergers would increase plan buying power and that this could result in decreased provider payments. They're also concerned that those decreased, potential decreased provider payments would cause provider networks to shrink and affect the quality of patient care. So as I mentioned before, the department reviews mergers for organizational, uh, financial, health care delivery system and product changes and we will consider all of these public comments that we've received in our review. So just to summarize, again, we protect the health care rights of 25 million Californians. We take this responsibility very seriously and our focus with each merger is to ensure compliance with the strong consumer protections and financial solvency requirements of the knox keene Act, as well as compliance with any negotiated undertakings. So again, thank you for inviting me to explain our process and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, and we'll move on to uh, Ms. Janice, Janet, Janice Rocco, Deputy Commissioner, Health Policy and Reform Department of Insurance. Welcome. Thank you, Senator. Um, and it's Janice Rocco, Deputy Commissioner, uh, on behalf of the department and Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones. Uh, it's helpful to be having this hearing at this particular time, given um, the proposed mergers obviously going on in California and um, impacting things national at a, nationally at a time when there are proposals um, that would impact California um, and people across the country to you know, take the five largest health insurers nationally and shrink them down to three. This is exactly the kind of conversation it's good to be having in the legislature as well as in the other forums that we're having them in right now as um, both of the regulators are looking at individual proposed mergers. Um, we're very mindful that with the 
proposed mergers, mergers um, approval is an almost permanent thing. Um, you can't really unring the bell once the merger has been approved. It would be very difficult to unravel any of these by future acts in the future. Um, and so it's not just that we're spending a lot of time looking at all the intricacies of this, um, but we're trying to look at them from the framework of how each one um, relates to the other and what the ins health insurance marketplace will look like in California um, after all of these decisions have been made. Um, in looking at the issue generally, um, clearly we're very mindful of reining in health care costs and health insurance premiums and ensuring timely access to quality care. Um, there's been some discussion today as well as in your briefing document about hospital consolidation and many of us know that the cost of health insurance is different in Northern California than in Southern California and that a factor in that are the disparate hospital costs based upon hospital consolidation. Um, the Department of Insurance has a new website, California Healthcare Compare, that we um, have put together with UCSF and Consumers Union where consumers can go to compare hospitals and medical provider groups on quality metrics and cost metrics. And that's one of the places where you can see the stark differences um, between the cost of care at hospitals in Southern California and Northern California. Um, that said, when we talk about hospital consolidation and concerns that things have become so consolidated um, that it's increasing prices. We do not view a solution to that problem to be um, intense consolidation of the insurance market where then you end up with um, two different industries that will um, have the ability to um, work together to maximize, pro maximize profits for both industries, um, really leaving the consumers without any ability to necessarily get affordable care. So um, certainly, as we're looking at these mergers, we do not believe um, that uh, a consolidated marketplace with only a few health insurers left standing um, is the way to combat the fears people have about hospital consolidation. And although the Department of Insurance has economists on staff, you don't need to be an economist to realize that what's necessary for fair prices, high quality, and innovation on a sustained basis is competition. Um, in terms of talking about the authority of the Department of Insurance and the Insurance Commissioner, uh, we do have, pursuant to the Insurance Code, uh, jurisdiction over acquisitions that would result in the change of control of an insurance company that's domiciled or commercially domiciled in California. Um, in those instances, we get a form, what it's often referred to as a Form A filing from the insurer that is trying to acquire the other insurer. The commissioner can disapprove the application if he finds any of the following. Um, after the change of control, the domestic insurer could not satisfy the financial requirements to um, write business in California, that the merger or acquisition would substantially lessen competition in insurance in the state or create a mo monopoly that the financial condition of an inquiring entity might jeopardize the financial stability of the insur insurer or prejudice the interests of its policyholders, that the plan or proposal of the acquiring entity to liquidate an insurer, to sell assets, or to merge with any other entity, or to make other changes in business practices are not fair and reasonable to policyholders. Um, or that the competence, experience, and integrity of those individuals who would control the operation of the insurer indicate that it would not be in the best interest of policyholders of the public to permit them to do so. And as you can see from those things that are in the statute, there's a lot of emphasis, as there should be, on how does this impact the policyholder going forward. Additionally, the commissioner has investigative authority um, that's relevant to the mergers. The commissioner can examine any insurer at any time pursuant to Insurance Code 731. The commissioner may conduct investigations and hearings pertaining to all business activities of insurers. We also are in 
um, contact with insurance commissioners in other states as they're looking at these mergers and often coordinate with them through the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the NAIC. And the commissioner has authority to monitor for anti-competitive actions. As I mentioned, one of the criteria that the commissioner can use to disapprove a change in control is that the acquisition would substantially lessen competition in insurance in the state or create a monopoly. In addition, Insurance Code 790.03 defines as an unfair method of competition and unfair and deceptive act or practices in the business of insurance entering into any agreement um, that result in or tends to result in unreasonable restraint of or monopoly in the business of insurance. And the commissioner is authorized under the insurance code to commence an enforcement action to impose fines and penalties or to, and or to issue a cease and desist um, order in such a situation. Um, as with the Department of Managed Health Care, um, as we look at the mergers, um, if we are going to approve something, it would be typical, it's not always the case, but it would be typical to have undertakings or agreements that the insurers um, agree to in order for the transaction to be completed. And when there are specific undertakings, the means by which those undertakings are monitored and enforced will depend on the nature of the undertaking. Um, we do periodic exams, um, market conduct exams, financial exams. If there are specific undertakings that are part of an approval, the department will offer enter into an agreement with the insurer and that agreement may provide for specific reporting requirements and may have specific enforcement terms in those undertakings. The department can also seek to enforce undertakings by bringing an enforcement action or even an action for specific performance. In terms of um, looking at some of the mergers that are currently under consideration in California, um, our first hearing was the Health Net Centene hearing that we heard, that we held in January. Um, a few of the people in this room attended the hearing, testified at the hearing. Others you know, certainly watched the six hour um, hearing that took place across the, across the hall in uh, 4202 um, that the commissioner conducted. And the range of issues raised at that hearing are illustrative of the kinds of issues we expect that will come up with at the future hearings. So I will mention a few of those things. Um, the overarching concerns center around whether policyholders would have affordable health care coverage with adequate provider networks maintained to provide timely access to quality care. The issues raised by witnesses testifying or in questions from the commissioner included whether HealthNet would stay in the commercial market in order to maintain itself as one of California's four largest health insurance companies in the individual and group market, how they would maintain adequate provider networks and make accurate provider directories available to consumers, whether provider rates would be lowered in a way that impacts access to quality care or prevents innovation, whether the company would agree to refrain from imposing rate increases that either regulator found to be unreasonable, uh, whether they would invest sufficient resources in their claims handling systems and their consumer complaint handling systems for them to function as they should for consumers, whether they would agree to increase their quality scores, whether they would remain domiciled in California and have key high-level staff and consumer service operations based in California, whether the efficiencies and improvements and cost savings that the insurers talked about um, would be passed along as savings to policyholders. And the issue that I expect may get uh, increased scrutiny at our future hearings, given the major national um, players involved, is whether the proposed consolidation of our nation's five major health insurers down to three will increase market power of those companies and decrease competition in ways that will be detrimental to California's health insurance policy holders. The Anthem and Cigna hearing that we will hold on that proposed merger will take place on the afternoon of March 29th. The hearing notice is up on our website. The commissioner encourages um, participation. We're not surprised we've already um, heard from a number of people who intend to testify at the hearing. Um, as Director Roulard mentioned, uh, Anthem is obviously one of the biggest players in California, you know, over 4 million covered lives, a $54.2 billion transaction that's being examined here. Um, and 
they're the second largest player in our commercial market, the first largest in the individual market. So obviously the decision there impacts a lot of folks. And then um, we do anticipate holding a hearing on the proposed Aetna Humana merger at a date to be determined. So this gives you a general sense of our authority and the types of things that we're looking at at the moment. And obviously I'm happy to take questions with the other panelists. Thank you. Any questions from any of the members? Yeah, Senator Pan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Chair, um, appreciate you have a um, challenging job here. I think uh, uh, Professor Ginsburg talked about trying to strike the right balance between having, uh, as we were sort of, this uh, sort of the healthcare markets evolving, um, being sure we have scale. The California is a pretty big state. You know, we just heard from a Massachusetts, which is a bit smaller in terms of population scale, uh, being sure there's the scale to do the things that need to do. Uh, you know, it's not just, uh, and then at the same time, ensuring that uh, there's enough uh, enough players. And of course, healthcare itself is a fairly localized market in many ways, right? I mean, the, the, um, there is people don't buy healthcare services necessarily, except from perhaps you know, tertiary specialty services across the state, right? Generally, you're looking at what's your local hospital, local medical groups, et cetera. People aren't always, uh, unless they have to, traveling far, far distances to try to get their um, their medical care. So when, as you're looking uh, at, at, at some of these issues, and in fact, that's the part of the challenge, right? So on one level, um, you know, if you look at network adequacy, it's about who's nearby. And, you know, if you're in a rural area, you may only have one hospital. Right, um, that in the next hospital may be 50, 75, 100 miles away. Uh, you're in urban areas, and, but at the same time, uh, when it comes to really subspecialized care, there may be only one specialist in the whole state, or maybe not even any in the whole state. California's a pretty big state, so most likely probably there's one California, although well, you may have to go to Boston uh, for that. And so when you look at these issues, um, um, you know, how, um, how do you ensure that people have, as you're looking at the, particularly at the access issues, you know, there's the issue of competition and price, but there's also, is the, is the organization able to provide the kind of um, access that, 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 that we want Californians to have? And I guess it's probably, I know DMC is probably the one that has the most to deal with that, but uh, um, are there things that we should be doing as a legislature to, to strengthen that? Or do you feel like you have the tools you need to, to be sure that happens uh, so that, uh, 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 so that people can get the care that they need. Um, so, and again, being a pediatrician, I know pediatric subspecialty care is a particular issue. Uh. So with regard to network adequacy, uh, the knox Keene Act has a number of um, elements to it that we, we look at. So first there's the geographic access, you know, for a primary care physician, 15, uh, 15 miles or 30 minutes. Um, but as you point out, um, for actually, for, for me, the key to, to network adequacy is whether people are getting timely access to care. So we do have in um, the regulations specific time elect standards that people are supposed to be able to get appointments. And so for a primary care physician, it's 10 business days. So if you can get an appointment with your primary care physician in 10 business days, um, then that is, uh, you know, we consider that to be adequate. Um, there's also, um, you know, some ratios we have for primary care and overall specialists. But the bottom line is that the health plans are required to provide all the services that are basic health care services and the mandated services in the knox Keene Act. And how they arrange to do that, whether they have a direct contract with the spe all of the specialists, specialists that are, are necessary, or they have to make allowances for people to go out of network to get the specialty care they need. The, their responsibility really is to provide medically necessary care to their enrollees and how they do that, whether through contracts or, or one-off agreements, um, we, we do look at that and allow for um, alternate standards in areas where there's not so many providers like in rural areas or particularly underserved even in some of the urban areas. So. I guess I would, uh, back to my question, I know, I know that we have a Knox Keene and so forth, but as we're talking about potentially a more consolidated market with fewer players. It makes it even more important, each of those players, um, that people have access to care. So I guess, aside from the existing law, which I know is there that you're enforcing, from your perspective as a regulator, 
do you feel that you have the tools that you need? I mean, you're, I'm sure you're enforcing the existing law, but do you feel like that looking at the existing law, that it's adequate enough to address these issues? I realize these may also be questions that advocates may have different opinions about. Or do you think that, well, you know what, we still seem to get a lot of complaints, or we're hearing a lot of stories that people can't, and, but we don't, our hands are tied because we don't have, we, we need, we'd need more to be able to do, take care of that. Uh, I think that the tools that we have are adequate at this point in time. Um, we do get complaints, as you said, from consumers around access, and we work with the plans to resolve those issues as they come up. So um, I don't have a particular suggestion for you at this point, but I'm, I'm sure there's other people here that do. <laughs> and then actually just uh, to follow up on some of the testimony uh, from the Department of Justice, um, I know as you're looking at hospital mergers and so forth, um, some of your remarks sort of imply, sort of, at least the underlying assumption is that people are working fee for service. So, you know, if you if you have a uh, medical group and a hospital come together, you know, you may have either more or less volume or something creating utilization. But of course, what we also know is is that uh, um, there's uh, certainly there's a lot of risk sharing going on. You know, you have capitation payments and so forth. So that can create a whole different set of dynamics when it comes to what happens, uh, both in terms of cost, utilization, and ultimately. Um, you know, the, the actual costs, that are how, what's actually paid for by the insurer. Now, what the insurer passes on to the premium, and we do have uh, the, um, uh, uh, we do have uh, law and ACA to also, in terms of medical loss ratio, so there's only so much that they can do there. But um, is, do you look at those issues as well in terms of, uh, uh, and maybe even when you look at the, the, the insurance for the other uh, regulators, uh, do you, you know, you're looking at companies, but they actually have different products, especially in the healthcare space, right? You have HMO, you have, you have different capitation arrangements and different risk sharing arrangements with medical groups, hospitals, et cetera, and they have different products. And so, and that multiplies the complexity because you have a company, but they have multiple products and those, all of those products behave differently. And so do you delve into that? I mean, it's, you know, you have five, you talk about five companies moving down to three, but then the question is, is the types of products they're offering or going to continue to offer uh, well, that, that dynamic and, and, and also how they pass on risk? I mean, theoretically, the insurance company itself is supposed to be the risk-bearing organization, but you know, we know in healthcare they're passing on risk to medical groups, to hospital group the hospitals to hospital you know PHOs etc and 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 how does that dynamic then impact um, obviously it's going to have an issue in terms of risk in terms of the sol the uh, solvency of the insurer uh, and that and the financial but also has an impact on access and um, uh, and quality potentially um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, how much risk they're bearing versus how much risks they're passing on to to to, to other entities when you're looking at this? 